Uh, my name is Michael Coates. I'm going to mute this. So we're talking about two different topics here this morning, um, the OS cheat sheet series and also the OS codes of conduct. So Colin will get up and talk about that second part in about 20 minutes. So what this is going to be is an introduction to the OS cheat sheets. Um, has anyone heard of that before? If you have, awesome. So the introduction will be perfect because most of you haven't. So this is actually really um, a pretty cool topic. Um, think about when you have a problem with security and say you're a developer and you're like, oh, XSS, that's bad. And you go to Google and you type in, what is XSS or how do I prevent? And then you go on this wild goose chase of information. And it's incredibly annoying. I mean, Google, yeah, it's great. You get to search. That's fantastic. But if you search for XSS, I think the first hit is an article from 2006 from Microsoft. That is not really helping people. When somebody has a security question, we have, uh, I don't know, maybe 30 seconds while they're searching to give them the information they want. Or they're either going to give up or they're going to trust information that's just totally wrong. Uh, there's actually a really good website out there that uh, collects code snippets from books that are security vulnerabilities in themselves. So we have these scenarios where if we, don't, if we don't make sure that the right information is getting into people's hands, they could get information that's either wrong or vulnerable itself. And that's, that's certainly not good. So the OS cheat sheets are, they have a few objectives. One of them is to be compact. And what these are is the cheat sheets cover various topics. I think there's 10 or 12 in total. And they want to cover this information in a very easily digestible way so that users can go to these, uh, these documents and get the information they want quickly. If we just gave everybody a book on cross-site scripting, that would accomplish nothing because that's not their goal to sit there and read 400 pages to try and address the issue. They want to get that information as quick as possible. So we, we strive in these cheat sheets to make sure that we're not being overly verbose. We're just giving the information they want. While we're trying to be compact on these topics, we want to make sure that we're covering all the different bases and that these things are comprehensive. Um, something like, uh, again, cross-site scripting, there's a lot of different variations. You can have reflected, stored, you can have DOM-based. And we want to make sure that when someone comes to these web pages, they get all that information in one shot. The other important aspect, of course, is to make sure it's correct. Um, the cheat sheets, when you look at them, you'll find at the bottom we have a list of the, um, the different authors and who's reviewed them. And they actually go through a decent um, process online to make sure that the information is right, it's accurate, it's conveying everything that needs to be. And then we actually uh, include who's looked at, this looked at this information. So you can take a look at the people that are building it, the authors have a little bit more confidence uh, in what information you're looking at. So I think that's kind of a nice touch. So here's a list of the different cheat sheets that are out there so far. So we've got uh, authentication cheat sheet, cross-site request forgery, crypto storage, input validation, uh, an entire cheat sheet just on DOM-based XSS, uh, talking about forgot password. Uh, I think that's a good one because when you look at an application, how many people here actually do pen testing of apps? You know, pa forgot password, they always mess that up. And the best thing is when you hit forgot password and they say, you don't need to reset it because we're going to send you your old password. And you're like, Fantastic. You store it in the clear. Um, so the forgot password cheat sheet is a nice one to address that area that, you know, everybody, everybody gets that wrong in one way or another. Uh, an article on SQL injection. Um, the security architecture one uh, sounds pretty interesting, and um, that one, I've looked at it a little bit and something I'll probably look at a little bit more. Uh, session management, the transport layer protection cheat sheet, and then um, again, the cross-site scripting one. Uh, the transport layer protection cheat sheet is one that I actually wrote, and that's about um, how to do SSL correctly. And I'll talk to it a little bit, um, well, yes, because I wrote it and I know it really well, but I think it goes to the point of the cheat sheets, and that is, at first, when you think about a topic, any of these topics, even if you have the basic fundamental ideas in your head and even if you know those correctly, there's a lot of edge cases that you might not have thought about. And that's where the power of these cheat sheets come in. And with the, the transport layer protection one, uh, myself and the other authors, we went through and we talked about all the different ways that somebody messes up SSL in their application. And it's not at the protocol layer, but it's more at the 
When you decide on your login page and whether or not the landing page that you start at to type in your password is SSL or not, a lot of people will make that not SSL and then post to SSL. They'll make the argument that, sure, the credentials are going across in the clear, so everything's great. But if you think about it, if you had a man in the middle or attacker, they would just change the first page and have it post somewhere else altogether. And when you talk through that scenario, it makes sense. You're like, oh, of course, I wouldn't do that. But sometimes if you're not prompted to think about it, you, you might miss that. And that's kind of the value in these things. As we go through and, and step through all the different ideas and really lay out, these are the things you should be thinking about and the best way to really uh, nail that home. There's also three other draft cheat sheets. So um, a cheat sheet's coming out on HTML5, uh, web service security, and password storage. Um, I haven't contributed to the password storage one, but um, I definitely have a few comments. Something to think about. The way we store passwords, the de facto is we hash passwords. And everybody's like, great, it's hashed. Everything is awesome and secure. The problem is our, our, our thinking with hashes is that it's a one-way operation. And that's true. In, in mathematically, hashing is one way. But if with computing power, if you can test all the one-way operations in an hour, it doesn't serve any purpose, because then you just brute force the password hash and computing power now is such that we can do that for the standard hashing algorithms. So sure, MD5, you can say it's broken in some use cases, and, and, and it is. But when you go and say, oh, I use SHA-256 hashing, that doesn't really matter, because the attacker will just brute force all of them. And you can say you use a per-user salt, but that still doesn't really help, because they can still brute force all passwords with a fair number of salts. Um, so password storage is something interesting. and something that uh, we've been thinking about um, at Mozilla, where I'm at, is using something called bcrypt. I know I'm, I'm getting off topic here a little bit, um, but, but I consider password storage to be something that we all sort of say, this is the, this is the way to do it. But in reality, um, it's really not as secure as it needs to be. And this is something where the cheat sheets can really drive that home. Um, so that's something to look for, is that comes out of draft. <coughs> so here's a list of all the different authors that are contributing towards the cheat sheets. So really, a, a large number of people, and um, it's pretty impressive. Um, if this is something where you have information, again, just like everything we do here, jump on and help contribute, be an author. Some interesting statistics about um, how often people are coming to these pages. Uh, over 350,000 views for the cross-site scripting protection cheat sheet. And that's pretty cool, because that was one of the first cheat sheets that came out. and um, it partially came out, uh, again, to further the mission of what we're trying to do. But there was also a cross-site scripting cheat sheet for attacking that uh, was made many years ago, uh, I believe, by um, Robert Hansen on his site. And so when people would ch um, search for cross-site scripting, that would be one of, the, the, one of the top hits. And people would find out, yeah, you can break things. And then uh, those were the most predominant attacks, too. But we kept having this breaker mentality, and no one was working on fixing the problem. So it's nice now when you search for cross-site scripting cheat sheet, you get both how to break and then how to fix it. So that's pretty cool that those are some of the top hits. Um, but in total of, of all the different cheat sheets that we have, um, over 740,000 views. So we're, we're doing pretty good here of drawing people in. Um, unfortunately, you would, uh, you would hope we'd have good Google search engine rate, uh, ranking for all of them, but we don't. So I think it's important to uh, identify these cheat sheets and how they can be used in your organization and uh, make sure that developers are aware of them so that when they have a question it's not whether or not they happen to get to the cheat sheet they know that it's there and they can reference that so here's a little bit more information um, on some of the top cheat sheets uh, for example these are the topics that are covered in the cross-site pre uh, scripting prevention So the way this one is laid out and the way some of the other ones are laid out is in kind of a prescriptive manner of here are the rules. If you're doing, if you're concerned about cross-site scripting, this is what you should or should not be doing. And this is nice because it steps through a relatively complex issue of the different um, points where user data could go. Um, you could have user data that goes into the HTML body and you could have um, cross-site scripting there. You could have attribute-based cross-site scripting where they escape a HTML attribute with like a double quote breakout and do like an onload event. Um, also, if you take user data and put it into JavaScript, that could be a 
Well, it is. It's a very common point of cross-site scripting and how to handle that. And then again, some of the things that you might not be thinking about, it's possible and it has been in the past to do cross-site scripting through a CSS style sheet. Or, yeah, CSS style sheet, but you know, CSS. Um, it's something that you wouldn't immediately think would be possible. But at the same time, if you're taking user data and for some reason or another putting it into a style sheet, it gives you that those things you should be thinking about and how you should be doing your encoding to prevent that. Now, whether or not this attack is still valid, I, I don't know the specifics, but at one point in the past, it was definitely an attack vector. <clears throat> and similarly, here's the uh, SQL injection prevention cheat sheet. And so we go through and we talk about the different ways of preventing SQL injection. You could do prepared statements, stored procedures, or you could try to escape the data itself. And as those that are familiar with this know, some of these techniques have um, drawbacks or potential weaknesses. Um, so we talk about which option is recommended and some of the things to think about uh, if you're going with an option that's maybe not the most robust and how to, how to do that securely or be aware of its um, shortcomings or pitfalls. And then also here we give examples uh, in some of the more, for some of the more common databases. The CSRF cheat sheet is, is a good one because this is a topic where there's been a few different ways people have tried to prevent um, CSRF vulnerabilities in their applications. Um, something as um, common as doing the uh, random CSRF token or also uh, ideas such as double submit of cookies. Um, so there's a few different ways you can go about doing this. And again, you know, positives and negatives on which approach you choose. But we step through it and look at those. And while I don't think you can read this one, this is the, uh, the, the transport layer protection one that I was talking about. Um, we go through the different scenarios and talk about all the different ways that you could create a vulnerability um, in your application at the communication level, so to speak, where data could be disclosed to someone that's trying to intercept traffic. And lastly, of the top five, I wanted to also point out yeah, the authentication cheat sheet and some of the topics that are covered there. Cool. So where are we going with this project? Uh, I think right now we have a good number of cheat sheets up there. We've gone through the initial push of developing those. We've, we're moving towards doing a revision across all of those to make sure that the information is current, uh, easy, to, uh, to, easy to digest, and covering all the topics that we need to. Um, Jim Manico is also helping lead this project. And uh, I think that what we want to do next is, is find ways to better distribute it to people. Uh, the wiki's great. It's a, it's a good medium where people can interact. Uh, they can update um, in real time. But it'd be great to have all this condensed into one document where you can just take it away and hand it out. Perhaps a PDF, perhaps something we can get onto our mobile devices or our tablets through an ebook or something like that. Because we struggle with this topic again where we create awesome information, but then we have to find a way to get it to the people that are important. And that's something we, we have obviously struggle with in organizations as well as we have the information, but we just want you to take a look. You know, just read that so that when you are coding your applications, you can have these things in mind. You can be thinking about them. But I think this is a really good first step um, because it's brief. And that's what I found as well, that the developers, they want the information. They want to do things correctly, but they don't want to search through an encyclopedia to make that happen. So the quicker we can give them exactly what the, they need, the higher chance that we're going to be successful. Right. Good morning. Um, I guess this is the second part of the presentation um, on a couple of OWASP projects. I think as you saw yesterday during the uh, lunchtime uh, discussion, there was, uh, you know, there's more than 100, almost 200 different projects. So what we try to do is um, give as much as, uh, information as possible about a number of different projects and we've got the, um, the showcase room as well where there are, there are more things available to have a look at. Um, I'm talking about um, a, new, a relatively new project, uh, All Was Codes of Conduct. <coughs> um, I'm going to explain um, what it's about, uh, what's included, where we're up to um, and um, some words about um, compliance. Um, it's at a different sort of um, um, audience than uh, the cheat sheets series. But this is, you know, OWASP needs to try to influence behavior in lots of different ways. And we try to do that, you know, with developers, with architects, 
um, designers, uh, QA people, um, but we also try to influence in some ways, you know, some things like standards organizations, government bodies, um, try to um, alter the marketplace a bit, alter the perception of application security. So we do these things at all different sort of levels and hope they contribute to the mix. Um, so you won't hear anything about pretty much any of the language that you saw on Michael's slides. Uh, you certainly won't hear the word cloud, advanced persistent threat, or even examples of code. Um, there are some things that are like rules, but they're, they're, they're somewhat different. Um, so um, sometimes people think code of, con code of conduct and they think, okay, rules of an organization. Um, well, I'm not talking about any of these things. They do exist. I'll just mention them just in case you, you are interested. On the, uh, the wiki, there are things about usage of OWASP brand, um, bylaws of the organization, and a di disclaimer about content. Um, there's an upcoming projects handbook. Um, I think it's, uh, it's a long way forward about how projects are run and managed. Um, and there are things specifically for chapters and speakers at chapter meetings and so on and the finance of chapters. And similarly for, for conferences there's a rather a lot of material. So I'm not speaking about any of this stuff but it does exist if you thought codes of conduct related to how OWASP goes about its work. Um, so therefore I'm not targeting, uh, these documents don't target any of these people or possibly not particularly anyone in, 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 in this room. It might uh, target some organizations you work for or participate in and it certainly uh, targets your, uh, go uh, the, the, the government bodies that affect the way your, um, your business and uh, your own country actually operate. So um, at the moment these are the types of groups that we're trying to target with these uh, documents and I'll explain why. Um, government bodies, uh, standards organizations, standards groups, education institutions, um, trade organizations, so professional membership, industrial, um, particular sector membership organizations, and also um, application security, training, skill certifying bodies. So those are the things. And the idea here is what we're trying to, what we try to came, come up with is what could all these sorts of other organizations do? If, if we as all was said, what would be the top few things, you know, one, two, three, four, five things that each of these types of organizations could do to support OWASP's mission. What, what would those be? So if someone came to us and said, okay, we are, um, you know, uh, we're uh, ISO, writing standards, what's the most important things that OWASP thinks we should do, okay? You, you've got, you know, a minute or two just to, to, to define those. Well, that's what these documents are about. Um, um, OWASP mission is there, so what we're trying to do is to uh, make application security visible. So how could all these other organizations, types of bodies and so on, contribute to, to that? We're not saying they're going to do it, they're just sort of aspirational. We're saying, okay, this is what we would like organizations to do. So they're just a set of minimal standards, a bit of a baseline. Um, they're not necessarily difficult to achieve. That doesn't mean they're, 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 they're going to be very easy to achieve because, you know, obviously there's a lot of inertia in, 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 in organizations. There'll be resistance. There's always, there's always other concerns and people lobbying for this, that, and the other. People may not think it's important. But, you know, we thought we'd document them. Um, the ideas came mainly from uh, the OWASP Summit that was in Portugal early, earlier this year. Um, and there was um, some working sessions relating to um, government bodies, standards groups, and education institutions, and there was also a separate working session about certifying uh, certification bodies. Um, and as a result of those, the outputs of those produced some draft documents. And I, I must have to admit, I didn't actually attend any of those working sessions that you saw there. Um, so I sort of picked up on it um, somewhat afterwards and provided some input um, and uh, a bit of rewording on some of the things. And since that time, they, they, the sort of the draft documents were languishing a bit. They were sort of like just floating around in some email lists and things. So I offered to try to pull that together as a project, formalize it, document it. And at the moment, they are still draft documents, but we're hoping to produce some release, you know, give them, uh, go through the project review and formally issue them as release documents so that we can then go and promote them and um, pass them on to people who, uh, who we might know in relevant organizations. And um, I subsequently created one for trade groups, which is very similar to the others. And I'm chatting at the moment with Jeff Williams about possibly one for commercial organizations that develop software themselves. Okay. 
So what's, what's generally sort of in them? Um, there's a cover sheet with, uh, at the moment we're giving them sort of different colour names, so the sort of shortcut names for them, so the certifying bodies is the red, the red book one, it's sort of a pinky tint really. Um, and then the structure of them, there's some introductory text, um, a small number, two, three or four things that are the mandatory parts of the code of conduct. Of course, no one needs to do them, they're not necessarily mandatory really, they're only if you adopt them, they're mandatory. And then there's other recommendations, which I'm going to run through briefly, the sorts of things here. And then on the back, we've got references about the codes of conduct and obviously some material about all was. So I'd just like to step through each of them um, uh, fairly rapidly. Um, the green books aimed at government bodies, so this would be uh, local, uh, national, re regional government, but also departments, directorates, agencies, and any other sort of statutory body, because also the names um, might be different in different regions of the world. Um, the important issue here is that government bodies have got a huge influence um, um, and on application security potentially, because one, they are potentially very large consumers of application software, and also they've got potentially a lot, quite a lot of influence um, over many industries and the behavior of individuals. So what, we, what all of us would wish, of course, is that they use this power to ensure that uh, um, software applications are secure enough for their intended use. So um, in, uh, for government bodies, we've got quite a few things. We're saying um, um, requiring application security, build application security into uh, software acquisition guidelines. Um, uh, quite a, number three is quite you know aspirational really. Um, providing OWASP a sort of notice and comment when there's uh, legis legislation and um, uh, regulations possibly coming out in regard to application security. We try to do this a bit with things like um, responding to draft NIST documents and so on. But normally it's you know public comment period, so we've got to try and look out for them and respond. Uh, it'd be nice to be part of the. Um, initial invitation to, to develop those drafts uh, and we, we do try to work in that area. Um, obviously they need some sort of definition of application security and you know create and promote uh, general awareness of, uh, so uh, government bodies have potentially got more scope for doing those types of things. Um, the blue book relates to educational institutions and of course as we know that um, you know, educational institutions, which might be your know, schools, colleges, other uh, universities, a anything to do with further education as well. Um, it's important that uh, we can try to get our message across to people who are perhaps maybe more in their formative ideas about uh, programming, developing, um, and, and other IT-related courses. So what we want to try to do is to make sure that we get the right sort of values in their minds. Um, um, so that we can expose them to um, good information in their sort of critical formative years. So we've got three things here, small, smallish sort of list. Um, actually having application security somewhere in the curriculum. Um, often that's not the case, even in um, 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 computer science type courses, um, even develop software development type courses. Um, we would like educational institutions to have a course is dedicated, of course, to application security. Um, and um, we also feel it's quite important that we try to get educational institutions tied together with local chapters. Um, and that's a way to potentially grow, grow or was chapters as well. Um, Yellow Book aimed at standards groups. So this would be people potentially like, you know, British Standards, ANISA, IETF, um, ITU, ISO, NIST, etc., etc. Um, and our, our wish here is that sort of every technical standard that involves software should actually take time to consider whether there are any, uh, any possible application security risks in the material that the standard's talking about. And if so, um, address that, that in the standard. So um, include an application security se section where relevant. Um, again, asking for comment on the standard uh, involve all WASP in that process and come up with some obviously definition of application security, whatever that might mean. You know, OWASP could come up with a definition. It doesn't necessarily mean that's relevant to, to everyone, every organization, every sector. So we don't really state what those things are. So you can see that they're, 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 they're quite wide, but they're, you know, they're potentially achievable. Um, 
the purple book, this is the one aimed at trade organizations. Um, I mean, obviously, many I mean, most businesses rely on their software applications, and trade organizations are in sort of a pivotal position to perhaps drive their membership to improve their knowledge, awareness, and um, robustness of their application security. So we see the trade organizations are a good way to try to leverage uh, different sectors. Uh, we can't reach every company necessarily, and there are some sectors that are probably much less aware of this type of thing. So if we said, you know, I don't know, um, legal profession, you know, um, they've got a lot of um, sensitive data. Um, are they thinking about application security? Maybe not, don't know. So there's some trade professional bodies that, that might be the places to approach. Um, so a uh, relatively short list of things, again, including application security in their codes of conduct, codes of compliance, their, their own type of uh, membership requirements. You know, you might get things in those now about privacy, possibly, um, uh, data protection, if you're uh, uh, sort of a European aspect of it. But quite often, you don't see too much about information security, let alone application security. Uh, and again, OWASP is quite willing to try to contribute to those efforts uh, by uh, uh, having some feedback, feedback into them. Um, and the last one that we've got as a significant draft at the moment is this um, red book to do with um, certification bodies. Um, OWASP um, is not going to endorse any particular um, certifications for learning about application security. Um, but we do know that they, you know, obviously other certification bodies play an important role in this space. So um, it was thought it was worth um, try just defining a, a small number of rules that try to set that, that scene. Um, so it's important, obviously, that they don't misrepresent um, anything as being endorsed or supported by OWASP. And it comes a little bit down to the brand usage guidelines. And, uh, thus this having a visible dis disclaimer about um, being based on OWASP materials. So that's where we're up to. Um, you can see there is some interrelationships between some of these things. There are some similarity about um, notice and comment periods. Um, there are some things that are unique to each, to each code of conduct. So those are the mandatory things within the codes of conduct. We also have some additional recommendations in each of them. So these are um, suggestions, not necessarily requirements. Uh, so obviously, for example, the third row down there, we'd love it if they were all OWASP supporters in some way, so become uh, uh, corporate supporters. Um, obviously, we don't really want to make that a mandatory requirement. It's a bit, bit too inward looking. Um, it's not as important as if they did the other things that we've already talked about. Um, and you can see there is um, a, uh, some things that are common across the standards and uh, the, the codes of conduct and, and other things which aren't. <clears throat> um, the question has come up on the mailing list recently about, well, if you know, some body said, okay, yeah, I'm doing all this stuff, um, what do we want them to say about it? Um, and I think we need, we, 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 there's a thought we actually need to define how they should refer to it, because we don't want people to say something like, um, such and such complies with all OWASP codes 100%, because that's a bit open to interpretation. Someone might think that actually means that they've done everything in the developer guide, the testing guide. Um, covered everything in the OWASP top 10 and you know 10 and 11 to 99 potentially that aren't quite listed in the top 10 guide um, um, and because of course we've got the word code in there codes of conduct there is this danger someone says it's OWASP code compliant uh, and of course there's, sort of, there's different meanings there that we have to be very careful about and um, one idea that uh, has been floated by Jason Lee is potentially to have to suggest to people that you know we give them some sort of format and they provide their own self-justification as to why they think they, they, they comply with these things and perhaps perhaps provide some provide some links and make sure that you know that if we come up with some idea this is the only way they can say it so it's a bit like labeling uh, but it then makes sure that we include the um, uh, sort of disclaimer about not endorsing anything and of course we haven't got the logo on here either so that's that's a thought. It's a little bit of a formative process, um, but it'd be quite nice to get some feedback from from people about those. Um, we do have this this one about uh, which might be called the grey book for software development companies coming along, um, and the idea there is I think 
the requirements might be something along the lines, making sure they've got a, a application security awareness program for software developers and managers, um, having engineering processes to identify and mitigate application security risks, and also have processes in place to um, ensure that those uh, mitigations are present and working in the correct, correct manner in the applications. So over the next maybe uh, few weeks or so, I'm going to finalize these version 1.1 documents, um, go through the OWASP project assessment process, which is there to ensure you know, uh, minimum quality standards on projects, uh, release those and do some work to, to promote them. Um, I think what I might do there is try to approach chapter leaders in different countries and say, okay, we've got these things, here's some draft letters, can you send them to you know, local groups in your own countries? Um, at the moment, they're all on the, uh, the, the, the wiki, so you can download the PDFs and Word documents. Um, and um, that's where I'm up to with it. So, okay, well, um, Michael and I will be around to talk about these things. Um, catch us um, and uh, enjoy the rest of the day.